Series, and I'm very happy to to welcome today um, Maribel Moray, who um, I came across because of her article that came out a couple years ago, uh, reassessing Hannah Arendt's reflections on Little Rock. Um, some of you know that essay well. It's been a very controversial essay, uh, one that I think is much more interesting than it's usually given credit for, and so did Maribel. And so it was nice to, to see her writing on it in a smart way. Um, and so we've stayed in touch. She's finishing up uh, a book project that started as a dissertation at Princeton University uh, through the lens of an American dilemma uh, on Gunnar Myrdal's work. Um, and she's currently a fellow at New York Law School. So New York University Law School. I'm sorry. I get mad. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> New York University Law School, a big difference. So um, uh, I'm very happy to have her here. And she's going to be talking today about uh, Gunnar Myrdal and Hannah Arendt mm -hmm. on race relations. Okay, great. No, I um, I think I have about 10 minutes to speak, right? That's right, 10, yeah, more okay. or less. We won't cut you off. <laughs> so I, um, basically, I'm going to bring out these different ideas so we can talk about a common topic on the relationship between our definitions of American democracy and how we define racial equality. So basically, I suggest in this discussion, as we go through Gunnar Myrdal's An American Dilemma, Hannah Arendt's Reflections on Little Rock, within the context of the Supreme Court's decision in Brown, one and Brown two in 1954 and 1955, look at how they uh, define racial equality and see that as a reflection of the way they envision American democracy. So the re relationship between how we define American democracy and its uh, consequences for how we can envision racial equality within it. So uh, the first one I'll talk about is uh, Gunnar Myrdal's An American Dilemma. I'm doing it in chronological order so you can keep it in, in track. This was published in 1944, written in 1942. It was uh, delayed by two years because there was a paper shortage during the Second World War in the United States. So Gunnar Myrdal was, as Annika well knows, is a Swedish economist from, um, uh, from Stockholm, really. And he was commissioned to do this project by the Carnegie Corporation, one of the largest philanthropic organizations in the United States. Um, in 1942, he wrote this study which said that American democracy required racial integration in all aspects of American life. So uh, he said that, he further explained that nationwide policy supporting integration and assimilation would prove Americans' democratic nature. Soon after its publication in 44, uh, the war ended in 45, President Truman's commission and our Committee on Civil Rights actually used it to write there to secure these rights um, study on civil rights in the United States. And most famously, the United States Supreme Court cited Muriel's project in Brown v. Board of Education uh, in order to justify its holding that racially segregated public schools were unconstitutional. And a year later, Brown II uh, in 1955 said mm -hmm. that this policy would be moved with all deliberate speed to make sure that the public schools were desegregated, specifically in the South. And while these schools are being desegregated in the South, specifically in Little Rock, Arkansas in the 50s, Hannah Arendt uh, sees a photo of Elizabeth Eckford, who's a young uh, black student going to, into school to Central High in Little Rock, sees her face um, and has a reaction that's very different from most Americans and most people across the globe. So this picture, as many of you have seen, she has this beautiful white dress. It's just, um, uh, she's walking into school alone. So uh, the other people who were supposed to go with her with the NAACP received phone calls that morning saying, the National Guard is not on our side. You know, we have to wait to get uh, into the school. We're not going tomorrow. But she didn't have a phone, so she didn't get the call. So she actually showed up by herself to school. Most people who saw this photo of this little girl going into the high school and these other students and mothers screaming at her and using racial terms, racialized terms against her, thought that this movement, this integration movement, really had the moral weight, the moral high grounds. Uh, when Hannah Arendt read it, or saw that picture, she thought, what is going on? She thought this federally enforced school integration project was illegitimate in, a in, in an American polity. So I'm gonna make these, put these different conversations in context with each other, and as a way, we're gonna talk about how they looked at American democracy. So for Gunnar Myrdal, he, was contrasting it to the Third Reich. He was writing in the middle of the Second World War, 1942, and he said, 
The United States has to be what the Third Reich is not. It's a regime that uh, promotes segregation by races. Um, over there at the time, he, was, he was analogizing the Jews in Germany to black Americans in the United States and said what the United States has to do with its most visible minority, the one that the whole world is looking at, is integrate. And that is how the United States is going to prove itself differently than the Third Reich. So American democracy equals racial integration in all aspects of American life. Um, and he talked about American democracy explicitly. The title of the book is An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem, and Modern Democracy. And the Supreme Court, again in 1954, which is a decade later, in 1955, in the 54 decision, when it states that uh, school, school segregation is unconstitutional, also talks about American democracy explicitly. It says, quote, Today, education is perhaps the most important function of state and local governments. Compulsory school attendance laws and the great expenditures for education both demonstrate our recognition of the importance of education to our democratic society. So education is central to a democracy, and it is provided by the state in the public realm. So, and because of that, because it's a state-provided uh, resource, the 14th Amendment comes into play of the U.S. Constitution, which states that no state shall deny to any person with it, within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So, what does it mean to have equal protection? Racial integration. That's when they cite Gunnar Mills in American Dilemma. The takeaway is that education is central to American democracy and it is provided by the state. Anything that's provided by the state has to be racially integrated. That's what American democracy means. Hannah Arendt, by contrast, does not mention American democracy explicitly. Actually, I, the, when I started thinking about her in the context of democracy, I started researching secondary literature, and I realized, ooh la la, this is controversial. <laughs> People don't think she talks about democracy at all, because in fact, she doesn't talk about it. And when she does, she uses square, uh, scare quotes. Um, but, however, in Reflections on Little Rock, uh, I realized why it came to my mind was because she doesn't talk about democracy per se, but she does mention free societies. So if we think that democracies are free societies, then perhaps Arendt's analysis of an ideal free society can help us see what she imagined an ideal democracy to look like. She didn't want to get into discussions of democracy at the time. But if we equate, this is something we can talk about today and see if it makes sense to us, but if we equate American democracy as an ideal society, and she's explaining what an ideal society looks like, maybe she can contribute to our discussions of democratic theory. So she's writing in 1957, uh, 58, 59, and she's writing against uh, totalitarianism. So it's no longer American democracy is not the Third Reich, much like Gunnar Myrdal when he wrote. It's American democracy is not the Soviet Union, it's not the Third Reich. And she says that a free society, unlike these regimes, has three realms. It has uh, political, social, and private realms, and each is gov governed by a different principle. So the political is governed by equality, the social by discrimination, and the private by exclusivity, um, she writes in this piece. And she distinguishes, she said, okay, the political realm is equality, but only adults exist here, because only adults talking to other adults as adults and convincing each other of ideas, is that really equality? Children are not yet ready for that. By definition, they're not adults. They are what adults are not. And they still need to develop. And as a little, you know, as a child to develop, they're in the private realm. And their parents are the ones who take them out into the social realm where the school is located. And during that incubator time period as of childhood, they're learning about the political realm. And when they have matured, then they go out into the political realm and treat each other as equals. So for these reasons, she says, federally enforced school integration was illegitimate. It was illegitimate, one, because it's treating children like adults, um, where a political issue is only to be amongst adults. You do not take children out into the political realm. And two, there's a distinction between adults and children, uh, which can't be broken. These are two ideas that she's writing in contrast to her vision of what totalitarianism is and what a free society is. Um, so the takeaway. By looking at Gunnar Myrdal's An American Dilemma, the Supreme Court's decisions, and Hannah Arendt's visions of the ideal societies, of the ideal American democracy, we come to see how and why they had the particular definitions of racial equality in the United States, why Myrdal thought racial integration everywhere was important, why the Supreme Court limited it to state-provided uh, services, uh, benefits, and why Hannah Arendt 
found um, federally enforced school integration illegitimate. It also helps us see how our own definitions of American democracy have consequences for the creative space we allow ourselves when defining what racial equality means within it. Thank you. Um, so, uh, are there, let me, let, me, let me ask the first question then. Um, first of all, did Hannah Arendt respond directly to Myrtle in her anywhere? Do you know? Is there any kind of communication between them? That's a good point. I haven't seen anything yet, but I would love to. So uh -huh. I mean, the more you, I research, I would love to. Have you to see looked that. at her archives or his archives and seen if there's letters between them? No, no, not from his. I've obviously um, gone through his archives, not from his, and I have still to access hers. And yeah. I, I think they were in different worlds. Yeah, I don't. I don't yeah. have, have any reason to, to, to think that they would be. But but. Um, so um. I guess one question is um, just what you. You, you, you made a very clear distinction between these three realms of Hannah Arendt's political, social, private, and you said, you know, rightly, politics is the realm of equality, P private is the realm of uniqueness or exclusivity, and, and social is the realm of discrimination. Um, I'm wondering how clearly you think, and you also then said that schools belong in the social. And I'm wondering how clearly you think that holds up. My, part of my recollection of, of Hannah Arendt's essay is that, is that it's really not about the social so much as it's about the private in the end. And what she's trying to argue is that privacy is absolutely essential to freedom. We need to have a realm where people can grow up, be private. And the argument she makes is that there is no realm more uh, constitutive of the private in our world than how one raises one's children. Mm -hmm. like that is, if you think about what it means to have privacy, right. that's what it is. Right. Um, and in a world in which we have compulsory education, the school is in a sense a sort of weird in-between, between the social and the private. Right. Um, now, the social allows for discrimination, and right. the private allows for exclusivity, so in both cases, it would not be in the political and therefore realm of equality. But I'm just wondering, um, and it's a question I have, I, I've actually found myself wondering whether the school is, you know, at what point the school is private versus social, and not that it, I think in one sense, these categories aren't hard and fast and don't matter 100%, but I'm wondering how, um, how you see this sort of interesting place of the school, and, and then really, do you think she's right? I mean, do you think it's fair or meaningful in any way to say that the school is not part of the public realm? I mean, this is the, thing, the question that people get upset about and disagree with over her essay. Right, no, I, I, right, so if I had to channel her, it would be that, and I will move beyond channeling her, yeah. but um, she does say that because school is in the social, that's why parents can discriminate. They can choose with whom their child uh, associates with. That's a right. No, I disagree. I uh -huh. mean, um, if I had to be uh, very, my own opinion on this point, uh, I think education is a right of the citizen, and it becomes it's a education and a political discussion that children learn about in school, and then can engage as citizens and voters later on in their adulthood. So I very much situate it in the public. Yeah. I mean, I think most people take that view. Her response, as so far as I understand mm -hmm. it, right, is that if you make that very understandable move, you basically say that the most important right of privacy mm -hmm. um, will be uh, subject to governmental uh, interference and regulation. Right. And once you make that move, there's no other realm of privacy that we can expect to cordon off government interference. Right. And these are tensions that exist in our conversations today. Right. I mean, and to some extent, and we continue the connection between Sweden and the U.S. in the 40s, there wasn't this fear of the government. It was um, people who were un unmodern, you know, uh, not scientific, uh, having prejudice who were the problem, but not government per se. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, when 
the role of education could be to create this common conversation. It's assuming, though, that there's a value in that and that the government is not something you should fear, but something you engage with mm -hmm. as a community, a nationally shared conversation. But then you do have this post-war 1950s discussion, which Hannah Arendt is tapping into, which is fear of government itself. Mm -hmm. You need to protect yourself from it and create different uh, realms. And we also see that different side of the conversation today in education. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just about creating a common dialogue, uh, but also about the parent having a right to instill the values on the child. Yeah, and yeah. she wants to say, if you're gonna have privacy, and you're gonna have difference and plurality, you gotta let parents raise kids, right. racist, sexist, right. religiousist, right? right? right. You, you have to let people raise kids differently in the private and social sphere, and then in the political sphere we have equality. Right. And that's what you know, she would say people don't wanna recognize, but I'm gonna let other people jump in. I had a, something, a totally different question, but something that just sort of builds on that. And I, I'm actually just hoping that, that you can sort of square a circle that I've just never understood about this essay, um, which is that so much of her defense of um, the privacy or sociality of education hinges on this idea that there is a transition point between the social, which is a realm of discrimination, and the political, which is a realm of equality. Um, and the thing that I just, I just cannot wrap my brain around what her argument is, is why that transition would ever work mm -hmm. if the social is fundamentally structured by the condition of discrimination. Right? Why would we ever expect anyone whose experience of the private and social world as structuring their entire world to be able to enter a political sphere under a condition of recognize other, recognizing others as equal, right? if indeed that was never public to begin with. Why doesn't that just sort of prime citizens for discrimination? Because that, that's what they, you know, has structured their experience of, of publicity per se. I'm gonna throw some other ideas back at you because yeah. if I'm answering it or not, then you can throw something back. And you definitely, Ajay, please chime in because um, you have a more exhaustive knowledge on these uh, topics. One thing that she was fearful um, at the time too is mass society. So uh, the social realm, right? Um, mm -hmm. Having the masses, and so she wanted people to be able to just, just be individuals, you know, do what they want, not just what society, this mass um, bubble, wanted individuals to do. Mm -hmm. She saw that as uh, a threat to a free society. Now, as far as the public, the political realm, uh, not she didn't seem to think that everyone was qualified to be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, you had to be able to think about the polity and not just your individual interests. Yeah, I don't, know. I don't know that I agree with that. I, don't know. <laughs> I mean, she, the, the political realm is around equality. Everyone can enter the political realm. She's not a Rousseauian. You don't have to be forced to be free. No, but it seems that she did think something. that everyone was capable of the conversations one needs to have in the political realm. I'm just not sure that's true. I mean, Lorelai's gonna have to put up with this for another couple hours. So go ahead. I mean, that's but kind I mean, of my it, reading it, of it. It, it, it seems like the whole structure of the lectures on Kant's political philosophy is to reduce this sort of basic condition of entering the public sphere, which is the condition of being able to make judgments with others, to something not only so basic, but something integral to interaction with others. That I, I just, It's hard for me to see how this is, this is a condition which some have, but some can't. I'm not channeling what I think. I mean, yeah. I, I, uh, no, I, I, think, I yeah. think I'm challenging your reading of, of Arendt. Your, your t of my reading of Arendt. I mean, I, these yeah. are things that, are, that I've only read about in the secondary literature. Mm. I haven't really penetrated it in my okay. own research. My research is mainly on her discussion of racial equality. Right. But um, I'd, I'd love to read more about how... I mean, one of the things that's very clear in her is that there's no amount of education necessary to enter the public sphere. If anything, she's sort of deeply suspicious. And she's, she's actually quite suspicious of education, <laughs> which is one of, the, one of the interesting parts for this discussion, right? She thinks that education can actually lead to, makes people susceptible to um, ideo ideology and totalitarianism. Right, I didn't think it was elitist in the way, she, I wasn't trying to say she was elitist and who could access the, hmm. uh, the public realm, the public realm. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that, it was more of a, a ability to think about society as a whole. In a way, it's not just about your individual interests, you know, your, your family's interests. It was thinking holistically.
basically. Yeah. And um, wh wh whatever she, uh, yeah. she thought about that, uh, she can't, she, she actually didn't think that uh, any exclusion on racial grounds right. would be uh, right. all right. For yeah. if, if, if that's the center of what we are discussing <laughs> today. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, but, but I think that there is a tendency, at least in, uh, um, for instance, human condition, where she, where, where she makes these mm -hmm. uh, divisions oh. explicit. That when she talks about equality, there she talks about how to uh, to uh, behave in mm -hmm. this political sphere, uh, where, where where you regard each other as equals. Uh, and uh, and I'm not quite sure that that she, at that point at least, uh, uh, discusses uh, who could who could enter and who could not. I find myself curious about what she had to say more generally about race and racial equality outside of these <coughs> essays. How does she, what is race? What constitutes race? What are the social underpinnings of race? How is race constructed? Um, you know, th th those are the missing pieces for me that lead to almost two disconnected conversations. Um, you know, one, which um, favors, promotes equality in the public realm, and then these, you know, three separate realms, which don't necessarily, I don't know, they don't, well, they, they allow for all kinds of discrimination and exclusion. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, before you answer that, can I ask a thing? Um, so I was reading in the comp lectures, um, if she follows Kant, at all in their own like philosophy, um, Kant kind of brings up this like world consciousness, or like he calls it the world spectator. Um, I'm not sure how far he actually like goes into this himself, but she kind of draws it out of him. So you can um, have doctrines, you can like be a dogmatist, but you can also s stand outside of that, and you can look at actions in the world as just a spectator, like an objective. Spectator, and I kind of view that as like um, the political. So I can see how you could separate the social and political realms in um, the way you did before. Like you know, parents can educate their kids however they want, but in the political sphere, you have to um, have like an, an, a mind of equality. Like you have to put aside all the dogmas that um, your parents taught you. So in the way, like in channeling Kant, I can see how she could kind of channel that model. I don't know, I think you... Are you saying like she's disassociated? Mm -hmm. There's this association between the two different realms. Mm -hmm. It's true, okay, so what you're saying is basically, and I will get to this question, um, so I wrote it down, so I had it right there. <laughs> but, um, so you're saying that she, so how would an adult, so how would that child get rid of what the parent taught them and move into the political realm? Yeah, I mean, other people as equals. yeah, I mean, maybe you didn't really, like, um, explain it thoroughly, but, like, um, you said, basically, like, you can, like, are you saying, like, when you become an adult, you enter the political realm, so you no longer have the uh, prejudices you had before, or, like, Yeah, I should I take mean, on I some of Hannah Arendt's tips and not <laughs> answer things when I write, <laughs> <laughs> because she didn't, you know, yeah. that's a really good question, and she did not explain so that's okay. I really like that how you posed it because mm -hmm. it's how does a child get rid of their own upbringing to in order to treat adults later as equals. Mm -hmm. That's a real challenge, and she does not address it in the piece. So racial equality. I want to hear more about this because I want to hear more where you're coming from. Well, I mean, it, it's she's writing in the fifties mm -hmm. and. One of the things that I've found is that very often um, people whose ideas are otherwise progressive or forward-looking in the 50s, um, and who are well-meaning, I suppose, you know, when, <laughs> you know, when, it, when it comes right. to you know, issues of race, um, are not very um, profound or thorough in their understanding of 
what race is, how, what, 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 what its constituent parts are, where it comes from. They almost sort of take, they, they don't examine race as a category. Um, and so, you know, I'm thinking, for example, it so happens this semester I'm teaching um, several courses on urban history. And we read Jane Jacobs. And everybody likes Jane Jacobs because, you know, she's so critical of, um, you know, uh, overly modernist planning. Um, and so she talks about how healthy cities are naturally diversity. Cities are places which are made up of strangers wholeheartedly. And, you know, basically there's a kind of implicit critique of any kind of, you know, racial tension that you're seeing in late 50s. New York and you know other uh, northern industrial cities, um, but she doesn't really know what she's talking about, you know. Um, <laughs> um, so, I mean, I just sort of see a similar kind of thing going on. I mean, it's really not until even today in public debates, you know, when you so many, you know, if, uh, I'm not a sociologist, but you know, this, this is something that so sociologists take up quite a bit now. You know, so much of the discussion is of racial colorblindness. What, you know, what are you talking about when you're saying colorblindness? Um, when you, when a, the society is racialized in so many ways. Um, so, I mean, getting back to um, rent, um, you know, I'm like you, concerned about this realm of equality you know, in which you would expect, um, I don't know, racial equality um, to be recognized. Um, but I see a direct link between, a bad link, between um, the social sphere yeah. and the private sphere in which there's discrimination and, um, you know, freedom to pass on whatever kinds of, you know, exclusionary practices, beliefs, ideologies, um, and the actual functioning of this public realm. There's Thank you. Now you teased out the ideas for me. And I want to hear more. Uh, the follow-up question for you would be what do you think she was missing in this moment in time when she saw that picture? But I'll ask you that after I answer your question, which was she didn't think about racial equality. Um, and she said, though, that this was the wrong way to go about it, the civil rights movement. So she said children are in the private realm. So that's exclusivity. And when they go to the social realm, their parents are taking them, and they have a right over their child and how they associate. Now, she did have a problem with um, any discrimination of voting rights, for example, which she thought were in the political realm. Um, she thought that uh, people should have the right to marry whomever they wished, which is a right to exclusivity. You have the right to be with who you can share your life with whomever you want. So miscegenation laws, she thought, was, should be on the top of the list. So she had her ranking of what she thought was appropriate for the government to enforce as uh, undermining racial equality or racial or equality or exclusivity in those different realms. Uh, and I'm, my question back to you would be, what do you think she's missing when she saw that picture? Because there, people criticized her at the time. Okay, well let me, I can just think of a very pragmatic example. Okay, now, so, so she, she does support public schools. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm still not clear how she supports public schools. I mean, because... But she doesn't support mandatory public schools. No. Nah. I mean, I don't think she ever, I don't know if she ever comments on it per se, but consistent with her reading, mandatory public schools at least should be questionable. Um, and again, I, I'd have to right. go through and see if she... Um, but she certainly believes the right to homeschool or the right to raise your kids. And charter schools. Or like not families. to school your kids. Right. I mean, so right. for just a... Well, okay. Uh, this is a, a make-believe scenario. Okay, so let's suppose, and this did happen in the South as a result of Brown, uh, a lot of parents um, uh, took their kids out of the public school. Mm. White parents took their kids out of the public school. And so... Um, you know, until you had sort of hardcore uh, Supreme Court decisions actually, you know, um, implementing Brown. Um, for a while after Brown, Little Rock, ironically, was an exception because Little Rock, you know, decided we are going to integrate <laughs> um, on their own. Um, 
But uh, so for a while, you did have this, I would say, uh, a system where schools were in a private realm. Okay, that's what people were, were doing. So let's, you know, sort of carry this out and say that what was left was an underfunded public school system in which kids were undereducated. And I mean, I'm just, you know, this is a hypothetical situation. This, I don't know that I can think of a specific case. But let's say the kids weren't learning to read and write properly in the public schools and that those public schools were mostly black. All right. Um, you have uh, rules on the books saying that you can't uh, vote if you don't have, um, you know, a literacy level, um, which not only requires that you read and write, but that you interpret, you know, very obtuse passages of the state constitution. All right. Um, kids in the in the private schools can do this. Let's let's just you know let's leave out prejudiced clerks, you know who decide. Okay, you interpreted this, and you didn't interpret this. Let's just say objectively, you have this disparity. So you have schools that are preparing kids unequally. Um, how does that affect the, the the public realm and participation of these kids in the future? Um, as equal citizens. I mean, I know she didn't think about all of this stuff, but, you know. These are great puzzles. This is why I think uh, scholarship on a rent is so lively, because these are important questions, which I don't, at least in this piece, she doesn't come to terms with, which is, what does it mean to create an equal citizen? You were mentioning this too. Like, what does it mean to foster someone so they can actually be an equal in the political realm as an adult? Uh, because education is so seen as something that a parent has a right over their child to determine. Right. That it would seem that children would come out very differently. And how do you from there go into the political realm of um, equality? But I will say, though, when she's seeing Little Rock, this is after, Little Rock actually closed the schools and, uh, for everyone. So she wrote this essay for commentary, if I remember my own article correctly. But, and then um, it was not accepted. Mm. So she wrote it, uh, she wrote that article when she saw a picture of Elizabeth Eckford going into the school. Uh, they didn't publish it, and she actually published it um, a year later with the sense. And it was after the schools closed, mm -hmm. um, and no one could go to school. Mm -hmm. And this is when she thought it was a new emergency in the mm -hmm. topic. Uh, but yes, I think it's a really interesting question. I'd love to read someone uh, working on that puzzle. Right. It seems to me, you know, I mean, I'm just um, going to put this out here. It seems to me that she was, this was more of a responsive piece. I mean, I don't think it's, she, she really thought about it mm -hmm. from, from what little mm -hmm. I can tell. Um, you know, she didn't think about it in any kind of whole integrative way. Um, it sounds like she was responding to her fear of totalitarianism right. in the Soviet Union, this, as you say, fear of mass society. So she was respons responding to that, and she didn't really take the time to connect the dots. Um, right, another point to this is, to your point, it's almost, this could help you writing, it's almost a, a static picture of what's <laughs> going on. Mm -hmm. It's not even thinking of these children growing up as adults. It's static. So who is an adult right now in her picture? Mm -hmm. Are those people who should be discussing as equals? But there isn't a vision of these children growing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's actually is a segue mm -hmm. for my own question and comment. And I'll lead off with the question first, just so that it doesn't get buried. Um, the question is, what did, what if anything did Murdahl have to say about the relationship between children and adults, mm -hmm. or the division? between those two categories. And um, I ask, just because it's, I mean, I've read the essay myself, and it's, Arendt does draw this very sharp division between mm -hmm. um, children and adults, and children aren't adults. Distinction must be maintained. I mean, I think that's clear from her essay. Um, I'm coming at this from an anthropologist, as, as an anthropologist, and certainly Murdahl was cited within, you know, kind of the deliberation over Brown versus Board of Education. Right. 
other scholars who were cited were folks like Franz Boas mm -hmm. and his and his students. And um, among those students was someone like Margaret Mead, who did this work, Coming of Age in Samoa, which was about adolescence in Samoa and about how young people are these cultural beings that they are kind of they're socially constituted, and in a way that kind of reaches. I think in Arendt's terms, they're socially constituted in a fashion that reaches beyond um, kind of what parents do in the context of their upbringing. So it, it, this kind of Boazian scholarship introduces, like, blurs and sort of renders the boundary between child and adult kind of mm -hmm. more porous. And so I, speaking personally as an anthropologist and someone who does teaches class on youth and youth politics, for instance, I mean, I think that Arendt's distinction here is not entire. I mean, it doesn't seem warranted to me. It's maybe a, a, a normative claim that is actually kind of belied empirically. But I found myself now thinking about Myrtle mm. and whether his take on American democracy and on racial mm. integration and racial equality is inflected in some way by how he thinks about the relationship between children and adults. To come back to my question. Yeah, I know. This is really interesting. Um, the more I talk about uh, Mirdal's project and such, I realize what a different world it is from the one we know and how differently they define democracy, you know, mm -hmm. at least in the cohort of people I research. So he doesn't talk about children and adults. It was not a preoccupation of distinguishing them in, this, in the literature that I read. And he even was, um, as you would know, uh, working on the population problem in Sweden. And they talk about families, but as a a cohort that you, uh, you create public policies for. You know, children have a right to free lunches. Uh, you know, they have a right to daycare, et cetera, et cetera. So they're subjects of public policy initiatives, but you don't see a distinction and they shouldn't be part of public policy making. Um, and this too goes to the other point that has come up when I mentioned this project, uh, the book project, is that he didn't see a problem with federalism you know, with using a federal government versus local government, state government, all these divisions that we see Hannah Arendt doing in her own piece on Reflection on Little Rock, this compartmentalization of what it means to have a, a ideal free society, just isn't there for uh, Gunnar Myrdal. And part of this moment in the 30s is a dialogue with the New Deal, um, and before that with the Hoover administration. You have people who are basically invested in solving societal problems at a national level and analyzing it, using the social sciences for it, um, and, and in their own heads, trying to solve it. Um, and a, a democracy was a country that could use real science, not prejudicial science, was one that could really solve problems, be modern. Um, and integration became part of American democracy, not only as a way to distinguish itself from the Third Reich, but because it reflected true social scientific knowledge that people can can change. There's also the normative assumption that they should change and become part of the folk. But there's a idea that democracy is modern and reflects real scientific knowledge. Just a couple of things, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of picking up several strands here. Um, so you are looking at things as an anthropologist, and oh. you. Are you are you addressing? Are you addressing? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry, <laughs> I was behind Bridget and I didn't. Oh, I no, wasn't no, no. positive who the you was. Oh, okay. Oh, no. Okay. Um, and um, and you, you you mentioned the idea of where you sort of summarized um, some of the problem I see is that she has a static view. So I'm a historian, and you know one way of saying or of, of critiquing what she has to say is that um, she doesn't understand process, historical process, and. If you talk about integration, integration can be understood two ways. I mean, inter integration can be uh, tackled as a, you know, sort of a momentary policy decision. In other words, we're going to integrate society now. So, you know, the faculty was not integrated. Tomorrow the faculty is integrated. But then integration is a longer process. Um, and so, you know, sh I don't think there's any awareness there. So, I mean, I would be curious if I were, you know, sort of going crazy trying to figure out, you know, how this 
otherwise enlightened woman, you know, <laughs> says it, what, would she, what was she thinking? I mean, obviously she was motivated by these other concerns that we've mentioned, but I would really want to know what she meant by racial equality more generally. I would, you know, I would want to read more broadly. Um, and I would, I wouldn't... Can I add one thing to that? Uh -huh. I know Ian wants to talk, but just one distinction. She, do, she doesn't talk about race so much in her work, but there is a place she does, and it's in the Origins of Totalitarianism. And she makes a distinction there that, as far as I know, is not made by other peoples, but you guys who know more about this, correct me if I'm wrong. She makes a distinction between what she calls race thinking mm -hmm. and racism. Mm -hmm. um, so that race thinking is thinking in terms of race. Mm -hmm. um, Raceism is, and but she's talking mostly about anti-Semitism and other things at this point, but, but racism is a scientific ideology that mm -hmm. says that race is the key to you know, mm -hmm. all other areas. Mm -hmm. And while both can be problematic, race thinking for her um, is as old as the earth and is not, um, you know, it is, is part of what it means to be human. And it doesn't deny a common humanity. It simply says, you know, Jews are different than Christians are different from, you know, uh, Muslims. But, and we think, you know, and some Muslims think this and Jews think that, but we all are part of a common humanity. Racism is something else, and she thinks it's a modern ideology that only emerges in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and, and she sees racism as much more of a problem than, than race thinking. Um, so that's just one thing to, you know, you asked what's the background and the racial. Mm -hmm. It's not a distinction, as far as I know, that it appears again in her work that I've ever seen. And she wrote that in the 1940s. But I do think that's the background for how she sees race to a mm -hmm. certain extent. And it's important at least to, to keep that in mind. Um, I have more, but I'm going to let Ian... You know, and, and, and yeah, I, I was going to say, I think this is actually a sort of perfect segue to, because to, I wanted to get back to the question of what Arendt thinks to race is. And, so, and I thought that actually this, there's one dimension of this topic that makes it really interesting to talk about precisely that question, because it's one of the things that Myrdal and Arendt share, even though they come out in a very different place because of it, which is that I wonder if part of the difficulty Arendt has with thinking about the publicity of race, um, and the nature of race in the American social sphere, um, is that both she and Myrdal, Myrdal do have this paradigm of the German Jew as mm -hmm. what structures their understanding and experience of race. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a problem when what you're talking about is the South, mm -hmm. right? Where you have a very different constellation of the factors that both define a race as distinct and define a race as scientifically distinct, right? Um, so you have this sort of double axis. Like dermatological difference, right, mm -hmm. is the synchronon of race in the 1950s. In Germany in the 1940s, dermatological difference doesn't even matter. In mm -hmm. fact, Germans would talk about race as Christians and Jews and Islamic, which wouldn't make sense at all in the American South. This is wonderful wow. because I think this brings up a great point on even Gunnar Myrdal's blindness. Um, his analogies that he created were not just about Jews, and as he yeah. quotation, this is coming from a crisis in the population question, which he and yeah. Alva Myrdal wrote in the 30s. And he analogized poor Swedes and with black Americans and quote unquote Jews in Poland. So yeah. he's analogizing groups that, from the literature he'd, he had read to this point, were groups that whose difference was uh, environmentally created. So by the food you ate, by where you lived, that's why the differences existed. Yeah. You know, so this is, these are going back to studies of you know, W.I. Thomas and the Polish peasant, friend of Boas, as you mentioned. So it's the idea that populations can and, and should, can and should become part of the folk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's analogizing class, race, religion in our terms. That's how we think of it now. Okay. Um, and some people reacted badly to Gunnar Myrdal's project and said, you know, what are you talking about? You know, poverty is not the same thing as, you know, blackness in the U.S. It's, there's a culture to it. There's institutions that we value to have. And why do you, 
black Americans have to become just like white Americans to create equality. And can I add, I mean, that's actually, a, that's one point in which I think Arendt has a more interesting view of race in this case than Mirabel does. I mean, wh what she's saying is, we don't want people to become part of a single folk, mm -hmm. right? We actually want to create a political system that allows p different people and different groups who are fundamentally different, who have fundamental different views of the world, mm -hmm. to each have their private world, mm -hmm. a social world, mm -hmm. but then to come together and disagree and mm -hmm. fundamentally disagree and yet have a political world. Mm -hmm. Now, you can say it's idealistic or utopian. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can criticize it a lot and you can raise the question that, that both Worley and, and, and Ian were raising of, you know, or someone else, what's the, how do you move from the social exactly. to, to the political? Um, but her view is you absolutely virulently police the political mm -hmm. as a realm of equality, right. right? And if you do so, you can allow the, you know, she would never have allowed voting rights, for example, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be taken away mm -hmm. or, or, or right to marry in the private or, or other things. I mean, those were for her absolutely unnegotiable, mm -hmm. but she thinks you have to risk discrimination in the private sphere and even in the social sphere in order to have a real vibrant political sphere. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that's, I think, more interesting right. racially and politically than we're all, if that's, if I understood your exactly. characterization of Mirabal. And these are tensions that we still deal with today, mm -hmm. because do you promote multiculturalism? To what extent do you have to conform to create a common identity? So these are relevant um, dichotomies or contrasts. Well, historically, it's interesting. Um, you know, there are those who have written about Brown to say that, um, um, you know, to use the, the terminology that you're using, that um, what Brown did was normalize, um, or let's see, it, what it did was remove the possibility of what you're calling um, race thinking yeah. um, from acceptable public discourse. And um, I know within the African American community, there has been, um, you know, some debate about whether, you know, whether that was entirely a good thing. Um, you know, because there were people who wanted to preserve, you know, the, the specialness, uh, you know, all of the, the vokeness, you know, of, of uh, you know, being black. Um, um, so, you know. Interesting. This blew up yesterday on the front page of the New York Times, right? Mm -hmm. I've gotten tons of emails today about this article by um, Jody Cantor. Did anyone see this article? Mm -hmm. Basically arguing yesterday in the New York Times that uh, giving voice to Tavis, Travis Smiley and Chris Rock, basically criticizing Obama for being too white um, in, in, as a president, and, uh, and also accusing them of, dis of disproportionately, at the same time, helping blacks with his policies, which seems strange. Um, uh, but I mean, it was on the front page of the New York Times yesterday. Um, so I know you uh, Yeah, I'm gonna hold off for a second. Yeah, uh, I would be interested in, uh, th th there's something that uh, I've noticed since, uh, since I started moving between different countries. I come from Sweden. Uh, and um, when Myrdal writes American Dilemma, um, Sweden is a budding social democ democracy, uh, and it was for a very long time, and uh, that has made something which I actually <laughs> don't like about Sweden, and is uh, uh, very uh, different from most other countries, and that is not that there are uh, a lot of uh, collective solutions, yeah. practical solutions. For instance, uh, the common uh, laundry room yes. in, in every <laughs> there is in every house, <laughs> which uh, and, 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 and it, yeah. hmm? people leave the notes and say, "Please clean yeah. up after yeah. this." Yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a battleground. <laughs> so, uh, but. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I know that uh, Myrdal uh, sort of switched from uh, the kind of political thinking uh, which was common from the environment where, where he grew up, uh, uh -huh. like 
conservative uh, mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps even a bit of romance for, for fascist mm. ideas. Uh, but that he uh, later switched to to social democracy, mm. and it, it would in be interesting to know if he at this point was actually connected, as he later was, w with the social democratic government. Mm. I can answer this for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, Gunnar and Alba Nierdal came to the U.S. or traveled to the U.S. in 1929 under Rockefeller Foundation fellowships. The idea being. The Rockefeller Foundation, um, first through the Laura Spellman uh, Memorial Foundation, sorry, Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial, funded social science in Europe after World War I with the idea that these social sciences could help solve societal problems and avoid a second, what, World War. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the Rockefeller Foundation took over that and invited, uh, they invited different people across Europe who were young and promising to come learn the techniques of social science in the U.S. and go back to Europe and, and uh, help establish institutes um, and so forth and work in government. So they came in 1929, they got to the US um, a month, it was about the same time as the stock market crashed. I forget if it's a month before or the month after, yeah. And so they're amazed by this society in chaos. Uh, and up until this point, as you said, he was an economic theorist and she was dabbling in child psychology, interested in it, but not totally developed. And during this time, he realizes that he's much more interested in applying social sciences. So he's going to Washington and um, seeing how under the Hoover administration, uh, teams of social scientists are being invited by the Rockefeller Foundation. So it's this active moment of chaos and hope, or chaos and the social science and government, and all of it coming into their heads. And so when they go back to Sweden, a year they took a year to Geneva, from what I remember, uh, because he didn't have his chair. He was going to take over the chair in Stockholm and didn't have it yet. But they got there in 1931. And they became very interested, first Alva in the Social Democratic Party. Um, and she got him involved in doing more applied social research. They started co-authoring. It was also a great way for her to co-author because she didn't have a formal uh, PhD. And uh, he started doing more applied work. Had, he headed with um, Gustav Kassel and Joste Bage, um, the Social Science Institute in Stockholm. Um, and that's where you see them getting interested in the, the population problem. He becomes part of parliament as part of the Social Democratic Party. But that interest in the Social Democratic Party is coming from, I would situate it, uh, within first his own research in economics, but then their time in the U.S. That, is so, that is so ironic to me. No, really, that really is because, um, you know, <laughs> no, no, no. I, just as a historian, um, you know, and sometimes they teach the progressive era, um, the Rockefeller Foundation, and you know, all of these private efforts that had this idea of the intelligent state, the social scientifically armed right. state, um, all of those ideas are coming from Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and in the United States, they can only be privatized. They right. never, they never reach the public level. You're talking about like Daniel Rogers' book, Daniel Rogers? That, that stuff, yeah, yeah. And so it, 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 it can never happen. And so the idea of these you know, young Swedish people coming to the U.S. to study through the Rockefeller Foundation and then going back. Uh, and then Sweden becomes an example for the U.S. because in Sweden, it's oh, not just the U.S. Was. inspiring, but there's a labor movement going on that's distinct, from, as you said, from any other country, the strength of the labor party, uh, labor movement, I mean. And uh, I would yeah. also like to say that uh, um, this couple, Gunnar and Alva Nydal, and um, perhaps uh, more so Alva, they are uh, the prime examples of, of people trying to scientifically uh, structure the social mm -hmm. sphere uh, from the politically, mm -hmm. political sphere. Uh, and so uh, the, the, then I would like to come back to Nydal and Arendt and your interest in them because that must be a, a great division line between Arendt and Nydal. I don't know, I, I, I have never heard Is that Arendt something. Because Arendt is, one of, is probably one of the greatest critics of social science right. of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it strikes me that, uh, that, that 
this line? I mean, I don't know if that's a big part of the book or not, or the art. Or no, this is a beginning. I, this is a topic that I'm beginning to discover more mm -hmm. uh, because I, as I, they were independent projects, and now they're coming into dialogue mm -hmm. together. Yeah, that would be a great. I mean, yeah. to see her versus Myrdal as two ways of thinking about the impact yeah. of social science on freedom mm -hmm. um, would be a, a fascinating yeah. project because mm -hmm. she really, she really is a. She sees social science. At one point, she says, "In is it the essay on freedom, she says, or the social science is the greatest threat to yeah. freedom uh, mm -hmm. in the modern age?" Yeah. Um, so. And it reflects larger trends in how uh, Americans even thought about the role of social science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We really are, one last question. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, we got one. Oh, I was.